Gran. Welcome to the Farminar. It's another exciting Farminar by Practical Farmers of Iowa. We're glad to have you here. Wanted to ask, uh, make sure to call your attention to the viewer count in the upper left corner of your screen. Just click the number that corresponds to your uh, number of viewers that are watching with you tonight, and you'll see the results on the screen there. And also note the chat box. He is always available for your questions. We are here because 42% of Iowa farmers will retire in the next five years. And around the nation, we're seeing a big turnover in leadership of agriculture. And so it's a really good opportunity to help the support beginning farmers. And that's why I think we're all bringing us all here together to learn and share in the knowledge of, uh, of experienced farmers. We want to help, uh, as Practical Farmers of Iowa, we want to help ensure the success of the next generation of folks coming down the line. And we think we can do that. Here's a photo of uh, one of our member families, the Rosemans, great, great uh, family out in western Iowa. And uh, Ellen in the center there was a, one of our speakers in the past. And uh, we try to use the knowledge around us and in our communities to help other folks along the way. We've uh, begun here, Farminars, the fourth now of the winter Farminar series. We are really so grateful for the support of the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program, a federal three-year grant that we got uh, two years ago now. To, uh, to help uh, share the message and share the, the ideas sharing between beginning farmers and experienced farmers. And please join us, continue to join us uh, each Tuesday through March 13th for new Farminars. We've been doing these for about uh, three years now, and we've got about 45 uh, in the archive on our website, practicalfarmers.org slash Farminar. And then we have an, uh, another link to the archive there on the upper right corner of the screen. So please do use those uh, past Farminars and enjoy the ones to come. We've had a great focus on production as well and all of our all of our other events we do uh, on farm and, and online, we definitely focus on trying to help folks uh, resolve production challenges. So we've uh, we've been doing that for a while. We're happy to continue that uh, part of our service and we're glad that you're a part of it tonight. Our game plan is we'll do brief introductions, uh, just this very short one by me, and then the introductions from the two speakers a beginning farmer speaker and a more experienced farmer speaker. And then we'll have a great discussion on the topic and we'll conclude promptly at 8.30. That's how it's going to work. If you have any questions, you're welcome to put those questions in the chat box throughout all evening. Look forward to having your input as participants. What is Practical Farmers of Iowa? We are an open, supportive, and diverse organization that provides ecologically sound and enhancing approaches to agriculture. That's a great group, been around for 27 years now, started by farmers in the heart of the farm crisis and continuing and growing every year, growing at about 14% of each of the last three years. We want you to succeed. We want you to use our network and uh, gain the priceless knowledge that farmers have and are willing to share. And the best way to do that is to join our organization. For just $35 a year, you can join as an individual member. $45, the whole farm can join. There's many great benefits to membership, including discounts to our annual conference. Uh, you receive our quarterly uh, newsletter, which is a 24-page document with uh, great uh, photos and stories from farmers sharing a uh, further way of sharing our knowledge and expanding our network. You can click on that link on your screen and follow the online uh, links for joining. And we're happy to have you as, as one of our members. Over 1,700 individuals already are members. We at Practical Farmers are deep thinkers. Here's the beginning of our tour at the annual conference. We share our information and ideas. We believe in sharing and, and strategizing together. And we definitely share opinions. This is uh, Laura Krauss uh, sharing her opinion about uh, a, one of the keynote uh, addresses we gave at the conference this, this year. Fidel Baccio, CEO of a, a Bon Appetit management company. Uh, some interesting discussions after his keynote address. We do love PFI. That's that's one thing about our members. They really care about the organization and they want everyone else to be successful too. So that's what's really fun about our organization. Full of great wisdom and, and ideas and really fun people. Barney Barenfuse on the left here, a member from near Grinnell, Iowa. We really enjoy and, and relish uh, fresh ideas. We, uh, we, can, we can always have a great opportunity to, to, to discuss things and we want to continue that discussion in all kinds of ways, person to person on farm and online and at our annual conference and other workshops. So let's begin. Let's talk about uh, the topic at hand with Kate Edwards and Steve Pinkus. We'll start with Kate. 
you know, so I'll pull up her slides now and go over to Steve after that. And we're glad to have you all here with us to share the learning. Well, thanks, Luke. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'll Sounds good. <laughs> Great. Um, so I have to share a small story before I start. Um, in those presentation um, slides, Luke shared a picture of me holding a bag with a PFI um, badge on it. And I'm very proud of that badge because I won it um, at the Beginning Farmers um, Conference in December and a um, extemporaneous skit. So um, the skit involved uh, pig lagoons and a few other <laughs> <laughs> other items, but it was it was a fun, definitely a fun conference. Um, so I'm quite proud of that of that badge. Um, my name is Kate Edwards, and I own Wildwoods Farm in Solon, Iowa. This um, slide here shows a picture of me at the farmers market this summer on the left, and then the other picture is a picture of my field. The um, Solon is near Iowa City, and the uh, customers I serve are in the Iowa City and surrounding area. I started the farm in fall of 2010. Um, that was when the actual ground was broke, but uh, the work began far before that planning. I have one acre in cultivation, and uh, in 2011, my marketing outlets were a small CSA of 18 shares, farmer's market, and wholesale, a small amount of wholesale. Next year, I'll be discontinuing the uh, farmer's market and increasing the CSA to 30 members while maintaining a small amount of wholesale. I farm um, without a partner, but I have a lot of supportive neighbors and uh, friends. So it's definitely a community effort. This is a few different shots of the field. Um, the one on the top left corner is kind of a fun shot. It's a uh, overhead shot from a, taken from a cupola of a barn um, that's nearby the field. I farm on rented ground, um, and currently, like I said, I have one acre of production. It's managed quite intensively um, in a raised bed system, and uh, it's planted quite intensively such that cultivation wouldn't be um, Able to, you wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to cultivate the field very easily. So a lot of the work is done by hand. All of the work except the initial tillage and uh, bed forming is done by hand. The for fertility, I use composted manure and cover crops. This next slide is one of my favorite slides. It's a picture of some of the vegetables from this summer. I uh, farm both for practical and philosophical reasons, and I enjoy finding beauty in what I do. And so I. Um, it can be found with my iPhone at all times, capturing the capturing the the beauty of the farm. I probably took over 2,000 pictures last summer alone of of pictures from during the season. I spent quite a bit of time on um, developing a market for the products this last year. Um, I had a unique situation in that I had a general idea of how I was going to market the items um, at the beginning of the season, but some of the things that I had originally planned on doing had fallen through. So. As of about May 15th last year, I had no idea how I was going to sell um, the produce. So uh, through a lot of um, fun conversations and hard work, was able to start the, the CSA to the wholesale in the farmer's market. This is a slide of some of the CSA shares from this summer. One of the things that I love about the CSA is that the relationships that I got to develop with the CSA members, it's so fun not only for them to know who their farmer is, but for me to know who's eating the food that I'm producing. These slides are mostly late season or mid to late season boxes. The one on the far left is the last box of the season. I am planning on expanding the land base um, gradually over time. This year, I won't be expanding the land base, but will instead be expanding the CSA while discontinuing the farmer's market. But next year, in 2013, I plan to expand to two acres and then move towards having five acres in, produ area, in um, vegetable production. Over time, I'd also like to diversify. My dream farm um, would be similar to a 1950s Midwestern farm, except a few more acres of a bigger garden, a few more acres of vegetables. I love the idea of a diversified farm where the 
items can work harmoniously with each other. So in order to start in that direction um, this year, I'm going to add a few pasture-raised pigs, and um, then my midterm goal is to add some grain crops. Um, currently, the land that I'm re renting for vegetable production, I won't be able to do anything but vegetables there, but I have a, another neighbor that's going to allow me to do some um, animals there and then possibly some grain crops at some point. So at this point, it's kind of hodgepodging a farm together through various um, plots. Um, however, in my, lo my long-term goal and dream is to purchase a farm where I could integrate these diverse items. So I thought I'd share just a little bit about what I um, faced last year um, in terms of pest control as a starting point for um, Steve when he begins to kind of advise me on, on future ideas. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was that um, when the pests hit, they all hit at once. And I was a little bit unfamiliar with what I was doing, so it was kind of a, an interesting learning curve. I had, I think in one week, had five different pests appear in the garden that I um, had to identify and then learn what to deal with. Um, these are just a few pictures of them. This one on the far right is a, a good friend of mine and her daughter that would come out, Nancy Griffith and her daughter, to um, once a week to, to chat and help in the field. And this is them spraying cabbage moths. The picture at the top was um, some volunteers that were helping pick off Japanese beetles um, from the plants. I had a huge problem with Japanese beetles this year. Interestingly, the only crop that was really severely damaged was the basil crop, um, which didn't seem to be a problem for me this year specifically because I was um, was only using it as a supplemental item in the CSA and still had enough to put in the CSA. But I would like to discuss a little bit with Steve if that's something that should 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 be managed. We spent a lot of hours um, picking off beetles from plants, and I kind of wonder if I hadn't picked them off, would they have done damage, or was it good that we spent so much time picking them off? Um, the other thing was potato bugs. I did a lot of hand squishing of potato bugs, picking them off, and then also sometimes dropping them into soapy water. And then the other thing I dealt with was flea beetles. Um, and they used safer soap on the flea beetles, and then also covered the egg. Uh, this is for eggplant, covered it with a fabric row cover. So that's the end of my um, introductory slides, and I think it's uh, off to Steve to talk about his farm. Okay. Thanks, Kate. That was good. Um, I've got some photos, but they don't, uh, um, I think, Luke, you could just make them kind of drift through as we go through the webinar. I'm not certainly not going to present them all right now. Um, TP Produce has been in business since the mid-70s, and um, we've been certified organic for about 15 years. These are my two kids here a few years ago um, right now. Beth and I have been on this current farm for 10 seasons, 10 vegetable seasons. So we've had a chance to take a farm that was going pretty strongly from, from rented land onto land that, that another farm we now own, and also make that transition uh, while we were um, maintaining a pretty high level of production, or at least trying to. So we've, we have seen a lot of the problems that a new farm might run into uh, fairly recently, even though we're not that new a farm. Uh, we do grow 45 acres of varied produce, of some perennials like uh, strawberries, asparagus, and rhubarb, but mostly annuals, and about two-thirds of our production is sold local wholesale, delivered to stores uh, in Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and about a third of the production goes into CSA, where we pack about 500 boxes a week for a 26-week season. So uh, it's a pretty good-sized farm, and we have been through a lot of stages. I know Kate wants to hear some of that, and um, of course we started out much smaller, but have always had insects from the very first year, and I think most farms will have them. Uh, so we're going to, Kate has um, given me 10 questions that we're going to uh, use as a, a talking points tonight. Um, the very first question really is what pests have you had to deal with on your farm? And over the years, of course, it's been a huge wide range, but on our current farm, and even on the, the farm before it, most of uh, um, we see some of the same pests year after year that um, you know can really cause us some problems. So I'm just going to list them and talk a little bit about them. Um, number one for us, maybe not the biggest single problem, but one that has limited our ability to grow onions well is thrips, onion thrips, and these are very tiny little. 
of insects that live on the inside crotch of the of the onion plant where the new leaves are coming out. I mean, they do wander out on the leaves to feed. Um, they just rasp away the outer epidermis of the onion leaf and um, uh, kind of wilt and, and ruin the leaves. But more important are actually open up the the leaf to infection by diseases. Um, they also get in between the leaves of cabbage and cause kind of a blistery looking appearance, especially green cabbage, and uh, can actually get into pea blossoms and cause scarring that you don't notice on sugar snap peas until harvest time. Um, cabbage root maggots are a big problem for us unless we use row covers. And uh, they affect all cruciferous crops, really, early in the season. They are maggots of flies, that is the larva of flies. Uh, eggs are laid in the ground near the plants, the young plants. And as the eggs hatch, the, the maggots dig into the roots, bore into the roots of the plants. And if it's something like cabbage or collards or broccoli from early transplants, it can wilt the plants and leave gaps in your stand. It, almost will never take out the whole stand. Um, but if it's a root crop, like a radish or a turnip, it will ruin it for sale. Even a small infestation can totally ruin uh, planting of, um, of radish, turnips, or rutabagas, and so on. So they are a big problem for us. Um, cabbage caterpillars, um, you've probably all seen them, the imported cabbage worm, cabbage looper, and diamondback moth. Uh, occur on almost all brassicas. You know, it's specially attracted by cauliflower and collards, we find, and we use those two crops kind of as indicators. When we see these pests on our collards, we know that they're going to show up very soon on cabbage and broccoli, too. Uh, cucumber beetles uh, come and go, but can really be devastating to young plants. Flea beetles, especially in the springtime, uh, also don't bother larger plants too much. They can do some damage um, on uh, you know, mid-sized transplants, but they can really ruin a, a crop of young uh, plants just coming out of the ground. They can chew up the cotyledon leaves so quickly that you barely have time to go back and get your, your sprayer before the crop is gone. And they're also a major problem on eggplant. Uh, they're actually two different species. Uh, one species on the crucifers of brassicas and another species on eggplants, but they act the same. European corn borer um, has been a big problem when we grow sweet corn at times. And on peppers, you may not realize that they actually bore into the pepper fruit. They'll make tiny holes near the cap where the stem's attached. And um, you may find them actually inside the peppers. Sometimes we've sold peppers with them in there because we didn't realize what was going on. Um, but to be honest, um, our neighbors uh, were surrounded by corn and soybean fields, as some of you probably are. And with all the BT corn being planted, the problem of European corn borer has really diminished. It's actually, some, it's actually gone down to where it's n nowhere near as big a problem. Corn earworm, generally not till the uh, second week of August. Earlier corn, you know, from mid-July to early August um, is rarely troubled. Um, tarnished plant bug is a pest for us on mainly on berries, strawberries, and on lettuce also. Um, it's kind of a sneaky bug. It, 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 you don't see it too much, but you can sure see the damage if you know what to look for. And then two other insects that don't directly damage the plants but spread diseases pretty widely are leaf hoppers, which are very, very small. Uh, soft-bodied insects that hop around. <laughs> if you walk through a severe infestation, you will see them hopping. Uh, they spread aster yellows, which is a, a disease that affects lettuce and carrots, can be pretty severe, especially on lettuce. And aphids, which we don't see too often, but they're always around, and they tend to spread viruses through cucurbits, viruses that are especially noticeable on zucchini and summer squash and on pumpkin crops. So th for us, these are the main insect pests that we watch out for. And oops. well, um, another question from Kate is, how have our pest control methods changed as our scale 
has changed and how did we apply materials? Um, we have used all sorts of, this is a picture of some pretty terrible cabbage, what you're seeing right now. The one on the right has a disease called black rot, Xanthomonas, and the one on the left has been chewed up badly by some of those insect pests, uh, the uh, cabbage, probably uh, um, imported cabbage worm. And you know, even on our farm, we don't always get control done just as timely as we should. So I wanted to put this picture in. Um, we still use a very wide range of materials on our uh, tools on our farm. Everything from a 24-foot boom on a large tractor-drawn sprayer so that we can spray in an, a half of a field at once from the driveway without having to drive onto the field. So we can actually spray from our grass driveways um, during wet weather, and we can spray uh, using that boom type sprayer on cucurbit crops that have spread and covered the ground completely, or coal crops like Brussels sprouts that have grown too tall to drive through or spread too far, like broccoli as, as it's um, nearing harvest, uh, all the way to just small backpack hand sprayers that we use even on our large um, melon fields to walk through and hit the plants where the cucumber beetles are clustering and congregating. So having a variety of tools really makes sense. Of course, a hand backpack sprayer, you know, a hand operated sprayer is a good basic tool for a small farmer. But one tool that we found was really useful during our evolution was a motorized air blast backpack sprayer. And this is not that much fun to use, it's kind of like carrying a chainsaw on your back. It's noisy. You definitely want to use ear protectors. Use out a lot of fumes, but it will let you cover a lot of ground quickly. And these days, they might cost maybe seven hundred dollars. Solo makes a very nice one. S O L O. Um, they're they're run on a two a, a two cycle engine, and um, they you can handle a quarter acre of spraying very, very quickly with these crops, and you can spray large viney crops without having to walk around because it uses a, a, a very small amount of water and, and the power of air in order to move the pesticide along. So it's, it's something to check out. Let's see. Kate, anything else you want to know on that question? Um, I did wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the um, peppers. Oh, about the, um, yeah, about the... Um, the, the European corn corn peppers, because I had, um, <coughs> I, my fr well, I'm wondering if it's a thing, I had probably the first, you know, crop of peppers that came on kind of just all wilted on the vine. Would that be the same thing as this corn borer, or would that be something different? No, that would be different. The corn borer just gets into the fruit. It only bores into the fruit from the top and doesn't affect the plant itself. But over the years, and especially when we've had pepper plants next to grassy strips um, and areas that have, haven't been mowed for a while, we've gotten a stem borer into, the, into peppers. And we've seen probably what you're describing, where the plants will wilt or a portion of the plant will wilt. And if you dig into the... Yeah, this wasn't the plant wilting, it was the actual Pepper wilting. Well, I mean, it's probably the wrong term. Basically, rotting on the plant. Oh, I mean, you know, there are so many things that can cause peppers to rot. It's probably then not an insect, although it may be a corn borer on the inside. Once it gets in there, it could definitely cause the fruit to rot, depending on how far along the fruit. Yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering. Okay. Yeah, that's that's okay. Uh, that would be a common. Uh, cause of fruit rotting if you have corn borers uh, infesting. Okay, you know, I you were talking about Japanese beetles, and I can tell you had a real problem with them this year. We have not seen too many, but for the first time this season, we actually had, in 2011, we actually had enough of a problem to deal with it. And number one, just like you, basil was the first crop they went to. They seemed to love it. I mean, clearly they're attracted to certain mm -hmm. crops. Basil was one. 
we we tried doing just what you did, hand picking them off. You know, but we're talking about uh, plantings. We make three plantings of basil in a year, and each one's about a thousand plants. Uh, it, you know, it worked. It diminished the number of of beetles, but not for long. They keep flying in, and what we found was that um, we had two plantings actively producing at the same time, and one was more heavily infested. The other one just wasn't nearly as bothered. And like you, we, we just grow basil, really grow basil for CSA. So I think we cut back a little bit on the amount we gave our CSA members, just explained to them, you know, this first planting got ruined by beetles. But then later in the season, that wasn't much later actually, it was about the same time, we have a patch of about a third of an acre of uh, fall bearing raspberries. They were blossoming then, and the... Um, yeah, they hit those for me too. Okay. That's what I've heard from other people. Um, Keep going. They were really starting to do some damage. They were chewing on the blossoms and the very small berries, and we, we didn't, I just didn't want to lose that crop. So it seemed like something we could deal with. What we did was spray a heavy dose, that is kind of a maximum dose of pyganic in water that we applied mm. at dusk or even after dark. I remember turning the lights on the tractor so I could see where I was going. And we did it after dark for two reasons. One, to make sure that the beetles weren't moving around much. It was a warm night. It wasn't cool, but it, they seemed to move less um, later. And also to make sure the bees were cleared out because we had bees pollinating those raspberries. And after late dusk, they were back in the hive, so we weren't really bothering them. And it definitely killed a lot of beetles. It seemed to immobilize others, and it almost fully eliminated the problem. I mean, we had some beetles on there still for the rest of the season, but it was a tiny fraction. It was 1% of what we had before I sprayed. So I would say the Pyganic is a pretty good Japanese beetle killer and deterrent from that one experience. That's great. Did you spray more than once or just once? No, we only sprayed once. I was ready to do it again, but the beetles just never really came back onto those raspberries. The, uh, that that one, one spray did it for us last year. I mean, there's all these qualifications. Because awesome. it, it keeps changing every year. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I know. And you ask about soil spores, and I know that there are these spores that can kill it the um, beetle larvae in the ground, but everything I've heard says they are not effective. And that's because the beetles are so mobile. They're not necessarily coming from your farm. Mm. Well, they, you know, they may be, but there's also some coming from maybe a mile away. And you can't, even if you can treat the entire area around your farm, you can't stop them from flying in. You can't treat your neighbor's lawn, your neighbor's grasslands. So it's just not worth it. You know, you, when you're dealing with insects that are so as mobile as Japanese beetles, you have to look at a kind of regional solution or else just deal with them on the specific crop. Mm -hmm. Did you have them hit anything besides the raspberries and the basil? No, not really. They nibble a bit on asparagus. You know, but of course, that time of year, it's all ferned out. And they're so lush and they're so huge that it doesn't seem to matter. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, it okay. would have to be a really heavy defoliation before I would um, try and, and spray for them on our, our asparagus fields. And they were probably nibbling a few other things, but the raspberries and basil were the, the crops that we were really concerned with. Nothing else was a big deal. Now again, we may, okay. this is the first year we've ever seen them in these numbers, so if they get worse here, you know, we could keep talking about this for years. So the next question. Yeah, okay. hopefully not. Yeah, I, but they're not going away. You know, like so many new in insects, when often when a, a new insect moves into an area, it can be really, it's really severe for a few years because there's no natural enemies built up against it. Uh, the, you know, it's just fresh territory for them. But after they've been established in a region for a while, they often diminish in intensity. And uh, that may be happening, you know, that may happen with Japanese beetles. I don't, I don't know. Um, 
just just where you're at. You know, we're what 200 miles apart, maybe a little bit more than that. And the beetles have been moving from east to west, so they may get worse for a while before they start to ease off. Here, another question you've asked are what measures do you take to ensure proper timing of pest control methods? Um, in other words, that would be, I, I, um, how do we know when to apply, use these controls? Well, some of it's just experience. Um, let's go back to root maggots. Um, because these are soil insects, we really don't have a good control. Uh, so we use row covers. And we apply row covers um, on early planted crops. That means for us, you know, April and May planted radishes and um, white salad turnips, daikon radish. Uh, we apply those row covers pretty much as soon as I'm done planting. Because we know that if I don't, <laughs> we're going to get hit. We're going to lose uh, those crops, and they're just not going to be, be saleable. Um, where I've tried to, you know, kind of uh, tr trim back on the row cover, we always get burned. So it's worth doing it. And then the row cover has the advantage, too, of, of speeding up the growth of those crops, especially from those April plantings. So it has multiple advantages. It also keeps flea beetles off. So it's, good, it's a good solution at that point. Um, later on in the season, when we're planting rutabagas and our fall turnips, we really don't want to use row cover. I don't want extra heat. On there. So I've just been watching carefully <laughs> and um, we've kind of been lucky the last couple years. I, I call it luck, but I don't know why we have not had um, root maggots. One thing is about maggots for, is that the first generation, that is a generation that comes out in May, typically in our area, is always the worst. It's the largest, hungriest, most, uh, most likely to cause problems. So if we can control that first generation, then the second and third generations are typically a lot, seem to be a lot smaller. It's not, not always true. Um, other pests, we just keep our eyes open. Uh, on our farm, you know, I, I have a lot of employees, and many of them have been here for three, four, and up to 14 years. So I show them what to look for. They are out there, and they've got their heads down in the zucchini, and and uh, and they're out harvesting, and really see many of the crops uh, a lot close, more closely, and more often than I do. And my job for scouting, and my wife Beth um, often takes this role, is to go look at the crops that we're not really scouting, that we're that aren't up, to, that we're not harvesting, um, that we're we're just you know tending. So I've got to keep my eyes on things like broccoli and uh, coal crops and just about everything else up until harvest time. So the, the process of scouting <laughs> means just looking. You start to see problems. Look, even, look more closely. There are some good measures of when you need to, for almost every insect pest of when you need to start treating um, as an organic grower. Um, some of these are just getting developed. I mean, I probably should retreat a little and say there are good um, parameters for conventional growers. But of course, our, the tools that we have to use once we're starting to get an infestation are not so powerful. You know, they're more subtle. Like, they don't act in the same way as those powerful chemicals. So our thresholds for treatment are different. Um, using thrips for an example, um, I've been told and I kind of believe that as soon as I see two or three tiny little thrips per onion plant, it's time to start um, trying to control them, you know, at least to keep their numbers down. And um, the timing should be when you you should try and intervene before or at the very, very start of an insect, possible insect buildup. Before often means using a barrier like row covers 
or using um, an in-soil uh, preventative like um, predatory nematodes, which sound very appealing to me, but which I've not actually used. Maybe someone out there has and could type in their um, experience with it if they actually have used them. And, um, and then using some of our um, organic pesticides at the very early stages of infestations. Er the earlier the better, because we, we, all we can do is minimize their growth and slow them down a bit with the um, uh, materials we have. Hey, this picture that's up, up there is showing a monitoring device that uh, a UW, University of Wisconsin researcher, put in our onion fields to monitor for a leak moth, something I have never seen. And in fact, he didn't catch any in there. Uh, but it's something, it's a newly emerging pest in our area. And um, this is the sort of monitoring that it's relatively sophisticated that can help uh, help you see what's going on in your fields. On these onion plants here in this field, the, um, looking for thrips involves getting down on your knees and really looking into the crotch of the plant, in the middle of the plant, to see what's going on. But you can put some yellow sticky cards out there, and which will be attractive to thrips. And just look at those those sticky cards too. It'll give a pretty good idea. And actually, it's a you know somewhat simpler way to really check what's going on in your fields is to trap some of those insects in some way or another. This pheromone trap, you know, is uh, is, you know, is is a step up from those yellow sticky cards, a little more sophisticated. And there are other traps you can use for monitoring for corn earworm. Um, that's using a, a black light or pheromones. So there's a wide range of devices that can help other than just walking the fields. And remember that often infestations start from the edge or a corner of the field. The insect infestations rarely start in the middle. The insects tend to work their way in from an edge. And most of our farms probably have a lot of edges. So that's the place to look first for, uh, for potential problems. Also, uh, another example is in our onion fields, we know that red onions seem to be the most susceptible to thrips. They get the worst infestations, and they tend to be the type of onion that's hit the hardest. Well, we still grow a few, not too many, but um, they give us an indicator of what's likely to happen with the rest of the field a week later. If we see those thrips on red onions, we know it's really time to get going and, and start to control them over the entire field. Let me see. Frequency of spray, you ask about. Um, one, one thing that's kind of ironic or paradoxical about organic sprays are that you may have to use them more often than a conventional grower uses their synthetic sprays. It's because they don't last. They break down um, in sunlight. They break down, um, you know, under weather and um, just about any condition at all. Well, they're not persistent. Is the really the technical term. So you may find if you really have a problem, you may need to spray for something like cucumber beetles or flea beetles three or four times in a week, but. It could be that after that week, you've got them under control, or your plants have outgrown the problem stage, or you've just knocked the number of insects down to where the plants can handle it themselves. Um, the, we tend to spray late in the day or on cloudy days in the evening or in the evenings, and I I kind of have, I have a pretty strict rule that I don't spray much of anything uh, on the farm when anyone else is around, any employee. So that limits us to early in the morning, um, which where we tend to use things like surround, which is a clay, not really affected by sunlight, or uh, different fungicides that we use like copper sprays, but for the insecticides that 
are uh, broken down so quickly, we like to put them on the plants very late in the day, right before dark, because they'll stay on there and stay active much, much longer through the night. That means working later, making sure that you're out there at the right time. Also, the, the winds tend to be calm, and it's a much better time to spray usually than, uh, than the middle of the day. Um, maybe this is a good time to talk about something that you didn't ask directly, but it's about plant health. Because from my experience and from what I've read, and what you've probably all read too, and I bet what you've seen, the healthier your plants are, the fewer insect problems you're going to have. And I've been on three different farms. In the first one, we had plenty of problems. The soil there was not all that good. It was a ridgetop farm in western Wisconsin, and um, I didn't have the resources or even the knowledge to build soil properly there. And um, <clears throat> even when we left that farm, we had not, you know, we were still plagued by, by problems. That soil never got to be particularly good organically working soil. But the second farm we were on had um, really nice deeper prairie soils in, that had not been handled organically till I got there. But um, it didn't take all that long to get them working well, get the organic cycles up and active. And you know we saw certain successions of pests there. And um, as the soil got better and better, you know we saw fewer and fewer problems. And our third farm, our current farm, that we've been on for 10 years, um, is a very well-drained sandy loam, not, per, not particularly fertile, and um, under 2% organic matter, although it's starting to climb a bit. And, uh, but it's um, very, very suitable to growing, growing produce. Uh, vegetable plants seem to like these lighter soils, as long as we can give them enough water when they need it. So um, certain pests seem to show up at the beginning, um, no matter what. Um, our root maggots were here from the beginning, and things like leafhoppers, and especially aphids um, were here, and cucumber beetles, and flea beetles. And as, we, as the soil gets better and better, we seem to have fewer and fewer problems with these insects. I mean, healthy soil, you know, and I'm really talking about soil that's biologically active and well mineralized, you know, balanced fertility, you know, not too much nitrogen. Um, you know, plenty of, of available nutrients to the plant, um, soil that decomposes organic materials quickly, so there's lots of active organic matter in the soil, soil that has good tilt and is well-drained, that doesn't puddle and, and, um, and hold water too much. Um, I know that's been a problem in Iowa the last couple years, and you know, even in, in our parts of Wisconsin at times. Um, you know, this sort of soil will grow plants that are more vigorous. And it's, it's it part, it's one of the prime, uh, I, I don't know, not dogmas, but uh, prime movers of organic farming is that healthy soil grows healthy plants, which grow healthy people and animals. And we, I, I can vouch for that. Um, as our soil gets better and better, we seem to have fewer and fewer insect problems, not zero but definitely fewer. And along with that, in keeping plants healthy, is to make sure your uh, techniques of your cultivation and growing techniques are good, that your timing is proper, you're getting your plants and seeds in at the right time, um, you're using the right cultivars that have some, you know, the proper vigor for your soils and region, um, that you're growing good transplants, set them out not too old, and so on. Again, your soil is well-drained if, if uh, it's a heavy soil, and then it gets proper irrigation when needed if it's a light soil, so your, your crops stay vigorous and healthy. Not too many weeds, it doesn't have to be zero, can't be zero, but uh, plant health is really the key, more than applying these uh, pesticides. However, there are always pests that come around every year. We need to take care of them. So. The um, main materials that we have used over the years, 
and that, that we're leaning on right now when we need them are, of course, Bt, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, that we use for the um, cabbage uh, caterpillars. And we also can use them for uh, European corn borer if necessary, although it's not all that effective. Um, we also use Pyganic, which is a general wide um, ranging insecticide. We'll kill a, a lot of things, so we like to use it as little as possible. Um, as a direct, which is similar, that it has some, it's a little more directed, but it's kind of an insect growth regulator. We've been using it on, on thrips, uh, which are still one of our biggest problems um, in growing good, good healthy onions. Um, in trust, which like BT is a natural um, pesticide found in soil, but of course, you know, grown and purified for the insecticide use. Um, can only be used two or maybe three times any given year on any one crop um, to avoid developing resistance. But in a rotation with something like as a direct, can really be effective on crops that uh, on pests that stick around all season, like uh, flea beetles on eggplants. And then we use some surround. Steve, little... can you? Um... Yeah. Can you repeat the one that you said you can only use once or twice? Oh, in trust. Or a couple times a year. In trust. And is it because it's so potent? Is that why? Um, it apparently can build up resistance in the pests fairly quickly. And oh, okay. the uh, label is very explicit in, in talking about how often to use it uh, on certain crops because we don't want to develop resistance to it. But, you know. Would it just develop resistance for that season or f for once, ultimate resistance? Once you, have, once you have resistance in a particular population of insects, those insects will probably be hanging out on your farm in one way or another. And they will just become okay. increasingly resistant or a higher percentage each year will be resistant if you keep using that pesticide. You'll kill off all the all the the individuals that aren't resistant, and you'll select for an increasing percentage of resistant insects. So you want Is that a problem with other pesticides that you've dealt with? No, not really. It's the first one that, I, that um, I've ever seen this warning on of, of our organically um, accepted and approved pesticides. It's, uh, it is really a problem for conventional pesticide users. Because, um, because of the, the specific chemistry that, of, of those pesticides. But typically, these, these pesticides that we use have a much broader action. They, they work, um, they have different modes of um, acting on, you know, of killing <laughs> and um, messing up the physiology of, a, of an insect so that it's much tougher for an insect to build up resistance. So I don't understand, I don't know exactly why Entrust has that warning, but it does. You know, and that leads me... Okay. That, is that a conveyor belt of cabbages? Yeah, it is. It's a harvest belt that we use a lot. That's awesome. It's fabulous. On our farm, um, our fields are... You can kind of see the way some of the, the, all these fields are set up. They tend to be 50 feet wide and with about uh, 8 to 10 foot driveways in between. And this is a conveyor belt that will reach um, about 20 feet or 22 feet off the edge of a wagon. So we, can, we use it for harvesting all our zucchini and squash. That's a pretty big crop. We grow about two acres in a year, a big wholesale crop for us. And you can see us harvesting cabbage here. Uh, we use it. We use it frequently, and yeah, you know, but it, it's not really practical on a farm where you don't have, I'd say, at least five people working at a time because you need someone driving the tractor, a person on the wagon, and maybe two people, uh, three people minimum in the field, in order to make it have it make sense. But. Mm -hmm. It's a great labor saver. You get done working with this thing, and you feel like you're ready to go on to the next job, and you've picked tons of cabbage you know, without really having to pick up any more than one cabbage at a time. 
You don't have to haul around 50 or 80 pound boxes of cabbage out of the field. Um, it's not too expensive. It's about $2,000. You can get it from Nolts, N-O-L-T-S, in um, Charles City, Iowa. Um, uh, Market Farm Implement in Pennsylvania also sells this. And um, great, excellent tool. We had one that lasted about 10 or 12 years before we wore it out and had to buy another one. We use it on a lot of acres. Kate, you also asked about um, feeling uncomfortable spraying things like kale that are expo exposed to the spray. And I, I totally understand what you're talking about here. This um, is a feeling I've had too, and it's something I've had to overcome. I think one thing that gets us organic growers in trouble is that we feel like we don't want to spray anything on our produce. And yet, we have a responsibility to our customers, especially our CSA members, who have signed up and paid us in advance, and who have really cast their lot with us, to come up with, with good quality food. And if we don't do it, they, what's their alternative? They have to go to another organic grower, or they have to go to the supermarket and buy conventionally grown produce. The materials we're using are so much safer for, uh, for our customers, for the people eating our produce, that um, I don't think we should hesitate to use them when we really have problems. You know, and it just takes some experience to know when you need to start spraying and when you need to keep spraying and when you need to back off and stop when, it, when it, it's enough. But I, I talked about these materials breaking down very quickly and it's true that spraying BT in particular, which is, is really safe for mammals, on, on kale um, is, is um, very safe for your customers, for your eaters. And um, I, I think you should, you know, just consider the alternatives that, that, that they have if, you, if we can't grow it in good quality. The person who's getting the largest exposure. Yeah, that's a helpful perspective. Yeah, the person getting the, the largest exposure to these pesticides is you or me, the farmer. And when I go out and spray, I'm always wearing a, a good respirator, not just a dust mask, but a good pesticide respirator that you can buy from Gemplers or other farm supply companies, the type of respirator that a conventional grower would wear, because I don't want even any, any mist or dust in my lungs. And, um, and I'm wearing a, Kev a spray suit. Um, made out of um, Kevlar, no, not Kevlar, um, uh, something. It's just a white, lightweight suit made of some synthetic material so that I'm not contaminating my clothes. I'm wearing gloves and make sure I have a hat on and I uh, often wear goggles. And so I protect myself because I'm getting, a, I, I may get a concentrated dose depending on how the wind is coming. But that's at the, you know, the exact time that I'm spraying. Tyvek, thank you. A Tyvek spray suit, very lightweight and inexpensive. Um, so I protect myself, but I think that my my customers are getting effectively zero dose. Another thing is, every pesticide, organic, conventional, has a legal label. It is the label, and it has on there a lot of important information. Um, about how to use it, what crops you can legally use it on. And again, nobody's looking over your shoulder, but it's on the label. And also, more importantly, two times um, that give you some clue as to uh, when you can use it. The first is the re-entry interval, and it's the amount of time between spraying that a, a farmer or a farm hand can go into that field and start working the crop again. And sometimes on these, um, on these pesticides, that's zero hours, and you can go right in afterwards, but often it's four hours. Sometimes it's even 12, even for our organic pesticides. And 
The other interval is time before harvest. In other words, how long do you have to wait after applying this material before you harvest the crop for sale? And incredibly enough, sometimes that time before harvest interval is less than the reentry interval. But it does give you a, a very clear guideline of how long you need to wait before you actually go into the field or harvest. And reading the label will tell you a lot about rates and the, it doesn't necessarily tell you what insects it's effective on. It tells you what insects it could be used on and what crops, but not how effective it is. That's something you just have to learn from your own experience. But take a look at that label. What else do you want to know here? Ah, let me see. I've, you know, I've been so busy talking. I haven't been reading what's going on here. There's a good discussion about stock borer. Yes, very true. Let me, let me look at these. Certain levels of toxin. Ah, Sally, thanks. You said that right there about reading la the label. <laughs> yeah, we are approaching this the same way. Let me see what else. Ladybugs conveyor. Okay, good. All right. Let's go back to what you were asking me. Okay, Kate, another one of your questions is cucumber beetles, because you haven't seen them. Well, <laughs> they'll be there eventually. Um, they have gone from a major problem on this farm when we first got here 10 years ago to being a very, very minor problem. And I'm not quite sure why, um, but Right now, we deal with them mainly by transplanting our cucurbits, not direct seeding, because the cucurbits are most susceptible when they're really young, and even our transplanted plants can be chewed up pretty badly. Um, I think we use, we use some row cover, um, especially early in the season. And it's not just to keep cucumber beetles off, but to enhance the earliness of the crop. I think we had a slide showing zucchini with the row cover pulled off to the side. And we use, also use um, transplanting into plastic mulch with row cover on our first plantings of melons and cucumbers. So that really eliminates the cucumber beetle problem. But one thing we see is that on later plantings of, um, of melons particularly, Cucumber beetles will tend to cluster on just a few plants. It seems like they can, they'll just pick on certain plants. Maybe, maybe the, those plants are weaker in some way. Maybe they've been damaged or something about them is, it makes them a little more tender or susceptible. And the cucumber beetles will cluster on those plants. And here's where we use, still use our hand sprayer where we just walk up and down the rows and spray beetles where we see them. And it doesn't mean every plant, but it doesn't make sense to me to spray a general potent pesticide like Piganic over an entire field of widely spaced cucurbits when we only need them, that spray concentrated right on the plant. So there's a question here, do we use hoops with the row cover? And no, we don't, not on the cucurbits. They don't need it. Their growing points aren't right up against the row cover. And crops like zucchini um, are very strong and they'll push the row cover up. And crops like melons and cucumbers will just kind of flop over. And they do very well right under a row cover without a hoop. If we do get a frost. Do you put soil on the edges to keep it to stay down? Um, we actually seal them with rocks and rebar, metal reinforcing bar. We use, uh, when we're using a uh, 50 foot wide row cover, which matches our 50 foot wide fields very well, here it is. We use rebar, 20 foot lengths of um, five eighths inch. And then we have a nice collection of rocks that we've gleaned from our fields over the years. You know, generally 10 to, 10 to 20 pound rocks. 
and we put them down every 10 feet or so, maybe five feet, if uh, we're really worried about a, a field. And um, that seals it up pretty well. Putting soil on is, it works great, but getting the soil off is really hard. Once it's rained, <laughs> the soil just dries yeah, it's kind and of messy. <laughs> And we hope to get you know, two to three uses out of these row covers. So having this stash of rebar and rocks does the job. And um, well, that's how we seal the row cover on winter squash. Uh, no, we don't because the winter squash goes in late. It doesn't need frost protection. We're not looking for maximum very quick growth like we are on, uh, on the zucchini. We're not the melons. We're trying to get those. Um, those crops harvested as early as possible to get it to get them to market to get them in the CSA boxes. For the winter squash, we're in no hurry. So again, we will watch the winter squash carefully for cucumber beetles, particularly, and go out there with that hand sprayer if they need it, and hit them up with the uh, tractor sprayer as they get larger if they if they need it for some by then. But by then, they're typically beyond the point where the cucumber beetles are really a problem. So you will see cucumber beetles, I'm sure. And then we did talk about some of the other pests, but I could go back and talk about some of them some more. Let me, let me just take a look here. Flea beetles, probably a major problem for a lot of folks. Here's a question. Will we use kale? And well, we have used surround. And I have not used it instead of row cover. I, I, I have not felt like surround has been particularly successful in keeping insects away. Um, that's been my experience. Maybe we just need to use more and more, but um, we haven't seen it have that effect the few times we've tried it. We mainly use it surround on tomatoes and peppers to prevent sunburn, to, to kind of shade them um, once they in the middle of the season from the very hot sun so they don't get sun scalded. But we may be trying uh, surround and the kale and, kale and clay more um, I, uh, different crops against some some of the smaller pests like thrips, which I said is a real pest to us. Let's talk about thrips. That's an interesting one to me. Um, how many people have thrip problems or know they have thrip problems? I mean, if you have onions that are consistently um, Tops seem to turn white and silvery in the middle of the summer, you know, maybe late July, August. Can't really make it with green tops and, you know, until the tops go down. Tops kind of shrivel up instead of, of staying green and then falling over. It may be because of thrips. It's not easy to know. <laughs> Look at this poll. <laughs> wow. Look at that. That's great. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll talk more about what thrips are. They are very tiny little insects that live on onions that kind of live and um, reproduce down in the center of the onion plant where the new leaves are coming out you know, at the very top of the bulb. And um, the, the nymphs, the young, or the larvae, are very, very small. If um, you're very nearsighted like I am, you can put your uh, face right down in there and see them. But if you're not, you may need a, a magnifying glass or uh, some sort of hand lens to really see what's going on there. They, the, the nymphs and the um, adults run all over the plant, rasping away at the leaves and making kind of small whitish um, wounds. Uh, if you get so many of those wounds, that they run together, the tops start to look silvery. And the onion leaf doesn't exactly wilt, but, but on a hot day when they're fairly dry, the plants will have a, will have a wilted look to them, even, even when you don't expect it, even if you think that they're, 
they're moist enough. And that's because the um, epidermis of the leaf has been rasped away by the thrip. So they can really do a lot of damage by reducing yield. Um, but we find even worse is that they open up the uh, skin of the onion leaf, the epidermis of the leaf, to other diseases, things like botrytis and uh, purple blotch uh, and so on. So we have, we've been trying to control them many different ways for years. And a lot of it has to do with being ahead of the game. In other words, you have to be there when the thrips are just starting to show up. And that tends to be for us in South Central Wisconsin uh, about the very end of June. That's really a busy time where we're still dealing with strawberries and weeds everywhere, including the onions. So we often haven't gotten a, a, you know, ahead of the game enough to really control them well. But the techniques we're using right now um, is to do use a to alternate pyganic, not, excuse me, not pyganic, um, as a direct and in trust, as a direct is an as a direct and um, neem extract or pure purified extract. And um, both of these are pretty safe to apply. I mean, they're real safe to the uh, farmer. Um, and I've been advised by a, a entomologist to start with two applications about a week apart of a, a, as a direct and then switch to two applications of Entrust, and then, if still needed, go back to the as a direct. Um, and this is a better uh, pattern than, than alternating one application of each. He thinks that it would be um, have a lot more effect in knocking down populations. Um, we, you know, we continue to give it a try. It's not easy to get that spray down into the neck of the onion. Uh, we use a lot of water. We go slow. We probably use uh, 150 gallons of water when we're using our tractor sprayer. We use typically 80 to 100 on, on every other crop. But we want to make sure that the pesticide is, is really running down the leaf into the center. And um, I did mention somebody's asking our thrips what were on our green beans. It's very possible because we have seen them um, on many, many different crops. And they'll just cause some light scarring if they're rasping on a, a larger crop. But if they get on something like a bean or a, a young pea, the scar that they make will enlarge as the, as the pea and bean enlarges. And they'll, it won't look so good. It'll really affect the keeping quality and the visual quality of, of that pea or bean. But we have never tried to actually deal with them in at that stage on a pea crop. It just seems like something we have to just accept at this point. And it doesn't always happen. Again, one thing that another crop we see them on is cabbage. And if you look in your um, catalogs, uh, from especially from Seedway or Johnny's, they'll say some varieties of cabbage are thrips tolerant. Sometimes they use the symbol TT. And what that means is they won't repel the thrips, but they won't um, make the scar when the thrip is, is rasping away at the leaves. Uh, thrips can often get three or four or even five layers deep on the cabbage and uh, as it's growing. And uh, if a, a varieties of cabbage that respond to the thrips by making a scar will look very ugly if they have a bad infestation. Um, and this is something that really puzzled me for years until I, I was shown what was going on. Uh, so you, you know, we can we can have these problems and not realize what's out there. You know, just think it's something abiotic, something caused by the weather or some sort of disease. But in this case, you know, thrips can can cause a lot of damage. What else? Go ahead, Kate. Take it from here. Ask me some questions. Um, I wanted to go back to what you said about the root maggots, and you I heard you say that you used a row yeah. cover um, 
and, but it was for root maggots, and I was confused by that because to me, the way that sounds, how would it work if you're covering it, but it's coming from the root or it's coming from the ground? Well, okay, here's how. The root maggot is the larval stage of a fly. It's the nature of a maggot. And the fly, if you can exclude the fly from your crop, the, the fly isn't attracted until the plants are up and growing a bit. So if you plant and immediately put on a row cover, the fly isn't going to get in there, and it won't be able to lay its egg in the soil. Once the eggs are laid, putting a row cover on doesn't do anything at all. Um, one, one problem... So that's, that's been something that you would have to know ahead of time, that that's something you could be dealing with? Well, on a new farm, yes, you would have to know. You would have to... This is a pre preventative measure. Once the eggs are laid, there's not much you can do other than possibly these predatory nematodes. But I've never used them. They, they look promising, but I have not had, had experience with them, so I can't talk about them uh, directly. OK. But putting on a row cover at planting time means you also have to take it off once or maybe twice to weed. And we've seen that um, just leaving those row covers off for six or eight hours in a day while we're cultivating and, and hand weeding a patch of early turnips and radishes is enough to um, cause some, pro some problems. I mean, flies will get in there and there'll be some infestation. And year after year, you know, we see this in little areas, small areas, and the only way, way we can explain it is well, they got us. I mean, we're out there doing our work, and they're taking care of business also, the, the cabbage uh, root maggot flies. But um, it's important if you're using the row cover to leech, take it off for as short a period as possible. Now, one thing that's really interesting about these root maggots is you can predict pretty well when they're going to be out and about, at least when they're going to start anyway. Once, to be honest, once they've started the first generation, and in our areas there'll be three and sometimes four different generations in a year, they're almost always around. But there are peaks and there are valleys in their population numbers. And um, there's some really interesting work that's been done over the years using wild plants, common wild plants, to predict the cabbage maggot flights. And um, there's some work done in New York. You could find this on the Internet. Um, it's an article called Predicting Cabbage Maggot Flights in New York Using Common Wild Plants. And it gives some excellent information. Um, and one key piece is that early in the season, when yellow rocket or wintercress is in bloom, is about when you can expect the first flights of these flies. So that you need to be especially vigilant around that time and, and afterwards for several weeks. And before that, there won't be as much trouble. But in my experience, you should keep those crops covered. Now, later in the season, using row cover is a real pain because you don't want extra heat. And weeding, I mean, weeding under a row cover is always horrible. It's just, you know, you're making big mm -hmm. weed problems, as you guys know. So one thing that is, um, has recently been introduced to the American market is a, a mesh um, screen, uh, a flexible screen cover. It's from Marone? No, it's, um, oh, I forgot to get the reference. Anyway, you should look for it. It's, it will not um, build up heat underneath. It's an open mesh, um, open weave type of, of screen, very flexible. It can just sit on top of the crops, just like the um, lightweight row covers do. But it would be much more useful during the summer. It comes in different meshes, and you have to, you don't, to exclude these um, root maggot flies, you don't need the finest. Uh, you need something in, somewhere in the middle. But, um, Keep your eyes open for that. I think it's really worth checking out. Let me see. There's a few more questions okay. here. That leads me to another question. 
um, that I wanted to ask you about. Do you do anything to think about or to manage the cost of the pest management strategies? Because one of the things that I found was that even like row cover can be quite expensive. Um, just to think about using it wisely or when it really needs to be used or those types of things. Yeah, row cover is, and it's, you know, plastic material. So we want to get the most out of it. You know, we um, roll it up when we're done. We put it away so we can get some more use out of it. When we're um, trying, like, this squash picture where we really want to exclude insects, we you generally will use a new piece of row cover, but if we're just um, if we're not if we're using it for frost protection, we don't really care if there are a few rips in there. It doesn't matter if a few plants out of a whole field get get some damage. Um, so you know we there's a, cer a certain progression when the way we use the row cover um, from new to you know still pretty good to in tatters. We can still use pieces that are tattered for. Uh, late season frost protection, particularly to try and you know squeeze that extra couple weeks out of picking peppers. So you know that gives us the best value out of it. Um, using these organic um, pesticides, I, I think the economics are terrific. Um, I mean, we sell you know two thirds of what we grow wholesale, and um, you know we're still grossing over $15,000 per acre. So if I if it costs me, it typically will cost me um, for materials $50 to $60 per acre to, to spray um, almost anything that we use. It's kind of a, a rough estimate. You know, plus the, the time and the expense of the of machinery and all that. But, um, you know, if I can, it doesn't take much added production to earn back that Fifty or sixty dollars over over an entire acre, and you can you can pull through a crop. You know, by by spending two or three hundred dollars per acre where needed, you can it's, it can be the difference between losing a crop or having it very very difficult to deal with because you have to cull so much and harvest is is difficult, or having an easy to handle excellent quality crop because often you just have to pull the crop through. A, a on uh, you know a, a short term onslaught of insects or past a susceptible phase in their growth, and um, then you're okay. Then then your pest problems will diminish. So you don't have to keep it up you know for the entire life of the crop. Uh, usually. So I think that the money spent and the time spent is almost always worth it. Let's see. Yeah, that's a really helpful perspective because I think I would probably be on the, the end of wanting to save the money and then realizing later that it wasn't a good idea. So it's a helpful thing to think about. Remember, I, I, the type of farm we're running is a very high input, high output farm. We spend something like 400, well, I hire 400 hours of labor per acre. That's a lot of input. I mean, I see my neighbors, you know, they're growing. Uh, you know, an 80 acre field of corn, and it takes them a handful of hours to plant it and another handful of hours to, to harvest it. So 400 hours per acre, not even including my time and all the management. And, and um, you know, that's really the big expense. So keeping pests off is in the same class as, as uh, keeping weeds down. It's just part of keeping your plants healthy, pulling them through the rough spots. And you'll see plenty of rough spots as, as you're establishing yourself on a new farm. The soil just won't be up to where you really want it for a few years. I mean, I think it, well, I, what I, on our current farm, we really didn't feel like it was working like a good organic farm until the fifth or sixth season, even though we were doing intense soil building and, and you know, putting as much effort and uh, money as we could <laughs> Into, into our soils. It, it just takes a while before the plants start to get as healthy as you want. Let me see what else here. John is asking about squash beetles, yeah, squash bugs on butternut squash and melons. Boy, squash bugs are a tough one. Um, I don't have a, an answer for them. We've been plagued by them at times. Uh, it, 
I, I don't know that Pyganic is particularly effective. It may be useful if the plants are small, but once the plants are large and have started running, the squash bugs just hide. I mean, they're really active. You know, when you disturb them, if you're walking through the field, they just skitter away under the leaves. And unless you have a really terrific spraying setup, it's very difficult to get that insecticide under the leaves. Now, if a field like this zucchini we're looking at um, were affected at this stage, we could we could spray them effectively. But I'm I, I'm not sure that Pyganic would do it. I would certainly try because it's been a pretty good type of pesticide. Um, squash bugs are a real problem um, at times, and I, I I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet type answer for it. I think it, that it has a lot to do with um, good sanitation around the squash fields year after year and uh, making sure you don't have places for these bugs to overwinter um, in your fields and probably vigorous, healthy plants. But that's a very broad answer. So there's the th Okay, what else want to know? Ah, deer control. Now, on our farm, we don't have to worry about deer. If you look around at these pictures, we have very few woods around. We don't have much deer habitat, luckily. That's not you know, quite as pleasing to the eye, but <laughs> it's, it's better for the plants. Are all my row crops planted with plastic mulch? No. Not, a, not at all, but we do use plastic mulch on all our earlier plantings of um, cucurbits. Uh, again, I, I said that um, summer squash and zucchini are a big wholesale crop for us. So we do about an acre and a half in an early planting. And we do about three plus acres of melons total. We do all our peppers, that's about two acres on plastic mulch, even more, about two and a half acres this last year. Um, later plantings of zucchini, we've been having very good luck experimenting using uh, no-till. We, we take a field that has a very nice thick rye and hairy vetch um, cover that overwintered, wait until about the 10th of June when the vetch is flowering and the rye is, is heading pollinating, um, mow it, or well, using a flail chopper, actually, flail chop it is by far the best, not a rotary mower, and plant um, directly in that field after it's set for a couple couple weeks. I mean, the timing is we usually put our second plantings of, um, of, zu of zucchini and summer squash out at the very end of June or about around the 1st of July. So it works out quite well. We've had terrific luck doing that. and. Um, we don't have a specialized planter. We just use our Rainflow water wheel transplanter that we use for the plastic mulch transplanting um, with some extra weight, which is usually um, our largest crew member kind of standing on the frame of, of, of the wheel to make sure the spikes go in the ground. And that has worked out very well for us. But we do use a fair amount of plastic mulch. Out of our 45 acres last year, I think we had seven acres on plastic mulch. Our tomatoes also and eggplant go on there too, but certainly not everything. What else, guys? Let me go some more. I can talk more about leaf hoppers. Somebody asked about leaf hoppers here. Okay. Um, leaf hoppers are, are a pest because they spread aster yellows. And I, they're a pest that we've seen less and less of lately. Um, maybe it's attributable to improved soil quality and good plant health. Um, they say, uh, I've heard that aphids uh, and leafhoppers are attracted to plants that have excess nitrogen, you know, growing on soils that are unbalanced, being pushed a bit beyond where they should be by too much nitrogen. And it could be that we have gotten the farm to the point where that um, we're in pretty good balance. But, uh, or it just could be that we're at a low point in the cycle. You know, um, 
leaf hoppers blow in from the south. Uh, they don't overwinter here, um, probably anywhere in Iowa, even um, certainly not in Wisconsin. And they, they literally ride the southern winds in the springtime. And as we go through the season, the leafhoppers get more and more infested with the aster yellows, and they spread it onto the plants as they feed on the plants. They're sap suckers, and they stick their stylus in the plant, and they, and while they're feeding on the plant sap, they're also injecting these virus-like um, uh, infective agents into the uh, into the plant, and it takes about two or four weeks for the symptoms to show up. So if it happens near harvest time, not really a problem. Of course, you're not going to quite know. <laughs> I don't. But um, we see it as more of a problem in lettuce later in the season. We start to see aster yellows showing up on lettuce as misshapen, weird-looking plants, uh, typically in the second half of June. And then we're, we don't grow too much lettuce in the summer, so it's not as big a problem. Hey, before we go, there are three books that I want to recommend because there's a huge amount of information out there on dealing with, um, with insects. And the first one is uh, an informative book called Vegetable Insect Management. It's um, really, it doesn't talk about what to do about it. And it's not organically oriented. It's more IPM, Integrated Pest Management Oriented. But it is just a phenomenal book to read over and over and over again. And uh, maybe I can type these up once we're done. I can put the name on there. Hey, Luke, thanks a lot. That is from, you can um, go on the website at meisterpro.com. That's M-E-I-S-T-E-R pro, P-R-O, one word, dot com, to buy that book. It's um, put out by the people who put out American Vegetable Grower magazine, but a phenomenal, incredible bit of uh, hunk of information. Um, a really good, another really good book is called Manage Insects on Your Farm. This is a SARE book, um, Sustainable Ag uh, Research and Education Network. I think that's what SARE stands for. And um, you can find that at sare.org. And then another small but unbelievably valuable book to me has been one put out by NOFA, which is the Northeastern Organic Farmers Association, called Vegetable Crop Health. It's written by Brian Caldwell. They have a good series of books. They were written uh, uh, in the early 2000s, maybe middle 2000s. But I found them to be incredibly useful. And the book is called Vegetable Crop Health. And you can get that at... Um, nofa.org, nofa.org. So um, you're talking about value. I think you could probably buy these three books for a total of 60 or $70, and that would be value. It would keep, give you reading for the rest of the winter and beyond. I try and look at these books every year just to refresh my attitude and refresh my stores of information. What else we got? Fantastic. Good. Luke, thanks. You got the destroyed. I, I have one last question, Luke, if that's okay. Um, I was wondering how you deal with um, Colorado potato beetles. Ah, I don't because I don't grow potatoes. <laughs> it's, it's one crop we don't grow. Oh, no, okay. I, that's actually a little too glib. We see them on eggplant. We, we almost always get one generation a year on eggplant. And we've found that um, we... Since we're normally spraying eggplant at that time for flea beetles um, with pyganic or in trust, that usually takes care of them. But it's nowhere near as big a deal as I guess it would be on potatoes. They, they tend to just show up on a, in a few clusters, on you know, a few plants here and there. So mm. I don't have... Okay, and then I had a clarifying question about something you said earlier. I thought you said that the planting date of your corn, um, that you could mitigate European corn borer by when you planted it. Did you say that? You can somewhat. It's hard to get away from corn borer, but both corn borer and corn earworm tend to show up um, in, um, in August, at least, again, in our, in our area. Um, if you can get corn to mature uh, during July, you're... Um, 
going to have a lot fewer problems with both those, those insects. And that's especially true for corn earworm, which you know, can, really be, uh, can really ruin the quality of your corn pretty quickly. We use a, so planting as early as possible yeah. could mitigate yeah, that. We actually transplant all our corn. It's kind of, we only grow corn for our CSA members, and we don't grow a lot. We don't grow even as much as they want because it's, it's a low value per acre crop. It's hard to manage um, because of these insects and because of uh, you know, the, the amount of cooling it takes after harvest. And because we've had, too often we've had the experience of having corn that was just perfect on Saturday or Sunday. And of course, we don't pack boxes until Thursday. And so it can be a frustrating CSA crop. But mm, yeah. All right, that's it. I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's 8.30 and uh, we'll conclude for the night. Thank you so much to Kate and Steve for their wonderful input and, and preparations for this farm and art. We hope you have a wonderful, uh, wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thanks to everybody. Thanks, Steve. All right, Kate. I'll see you in La Crosse at the um, Organic Farming Conference.